Okay, so we'll get started. So just to introduce myself, I'm Zara Peskett. I'm an assistant head teacher uh, with responsibility for teaching and learning. Um, I am in a large secondary school in Milton Keynes, uh, Shenley Brook End School, uh, and we have a leadership and training centre and I do lots of facilitating there for MPQs. Um, and one of my real kind of passions is oracy and talk in the classroom, mm -hmm. um, hence me talking to you a little bit today. Um, so what you're um, doing, Marta, is you're going to be looking at some research and then some practical activities. Um, mm -hmm. Whereabouts is your school placed at the moment? Where are you? Uh, I work in Warden Hill Junior School. It's in Luton. Ah, okay, brilliant. So you're not too far away. No. Perfect. Okay, so um, lots of the evidence around RSC and talk in the classroom, as always, comes from the Education Endowment Fund. Um, the EEF is a huge body of research that you have probably come across in your training year um, and in your NQT year. Um, and they pick out on their teacher toolkit, oracy being one of the kind of the key things that if you can get it going in a classroom, it doesn't cost a lot, but, but the impact is huge on progress. Um, and lots of our kind of language interventions that we have um, in school are about trying to get students to talk. So the National Body of Evidence is actually quite informed by a school called School 21. Um, I've been fortunate enough to go to School 21 quite a few times, um, but School 21 is basically a school in London um, in quite a deprived area. I don't think they'd mind me saying uh, in Stratford in London um, and School 21's main focus is talk and a talk curriculum. Um, and they spend a lot of time looking at what makes a good orator, what makes a good talker and how do we encourage talk in the classroom. So I do want today to be practical um, and hopefully that will help um, with things going forward in the classroom. So that's kind of the research base that we're, we're kind of, we're going from. I always start this session on talk by talking about listening, which might sound a little bit counterintuitive, but the reality is in a class, if somebody is talking, the reality is that the majority are listening. And I know obviously in primary, that idea of active listening is just as important um, as talk. So I just wanted to see if we could have a little bit of fun to start with on this grey, uh, dark day. Um, so Marta and Ian, if you want to join in, you can. It's entirely up to you. Um, I'm going to describe something and I would like you to try and draw that something on your whiteboard. So are you up for this? Yes, yes, okay. I'll try. I'll go back. <laughs> we love a trial, right. Okay, so in the centre of the page, there is a dot. Around your dot, there is a wibbly wobbly circle. On the left hand side of your wibbly wobbly circle is a line with lots of different branches coming off it. Left. Okay. On the right hand side, connected to your wibbly wobbly circle is a long horizontal line and on that long horizontal line there's like cushions pockets along that line so on top of that line there's like little circles so it looks a little bit like a line of beads Okay, brilliant. So I can obviously see what you are drawing. You might not be able to see each other. So I'm just going to show you what I can see here. So if I share my screen, you should be able to see Marta yours. 
and uh-huh. Ian Gisair. And they're pretty similar, actually. I'll give you that. I'll give you that. Um, so what you are actually drawing um, at this moment in time is a neuron. Mm-hmm. And if I am um, to show you here, this is what I was describing. Mm-hmm. Now, that went pretty well. And the reason it went pretty well is because as teachers, we are used to active listing and I'm used to or rating. I'm used to saying to the left, to the right. So if you were, Marta, to do that with your year five class, what would happen? They'll, well, they'll probably follow his instructions. My more, yeah. more able children would do it right. Maybe my less able would need some help, maybe with the vocabulary like left, right. Yeah, what I can think of. So it's this, the idea behind this task is obviously it's as much about the listening as it is about the talk. So what you've got on the screen is something called the listening ladder. There's lots of different versions of this, but like I said, I quite like using Voice 21's um, resources, even though some of the wording might need adjusting slightly for primary. Um, but I often put this on the board while we're having a discussion. Mm -hmm. Um, So just reminding people what they're doing. So while somebody else is talking, you're giving eye contact to the speaker, you know, you're being calm and still. I know sometimes you talk about in primary, you know, you put your hands in your lap or you you, no fiddly hands, whatever it might be. Um, You're allowed to ask questions to clarify your understanding. So (laughs) at one point, Marty went left um, and obviously If you hadn't have got that, I would have been able to, because you were younger, um, explain that. Um, But again, just a resource that is quite often quite helpful to just have to pull up that's already been made that you can put to say, this is what you're doing. And, you know, rather than disturbing the person talking, if the class aren't doing what they need to do, you can just kind of point to something on the ladder um, that they should be doing. So the next thing I kind of wanted to think about with talk. So the first thing I guess I want people take away is that the listening is just as important as the talk. But the second thing I wanted to kind of discuss is grouping for talk, because quite often when you go around lesson observations or you you go around observing lessons and you see talk, it's oh just with the person next to you. It's kind of done on the hoof rather than pre-planned. So if you were to pre-plan your groups to help facilitate the talk, what might they look like? So in your classroom, typically, Marta, if you're going to get um, students together to talk, how would you group them? I'll probably try mixed ability. Yeah. So children who are uh, who find it easier to speak, they would help the quieter children. Yeah, absolutely. So you kind of go on your knowledge of the students, maybe, yes. that's what you think. And also how also their friendship. So I know that some children work well together. So I know I can put them together. I yeah. think that's also important. So they get on with the person they will talk to. Yeah, because we've all been there, haven't we? We're in a conversation we're not quite comfortable with uh, with somebody. And that, that does make it quite stilted. Um, thank you. I've just realised we've got some other people here. So just very quickly have a quick interlude. Alex, Emma, Helen and Julie. Are you guys able to unmic? So if I say Alex, are you able to unmic now? Okay, I'm going to move on from Alex. Emma, are you able to unmic? Alex, I think I can hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Perfect. (laughs) Yay. (laughs) Hello, Alex. Um, and Helen, are you with us? Yes, hi. Hi, Helen. And Emma? Yes, here. Brilliant. Okay, so to, I'm going to ask the same question. Um, at the beginning, can you just say the phase that you are in? So if you're primary, secondary, special school. Uh, so Alex, what phase are you teaching? Um, I teach in reception. Brilliant. So how would you group for talk in your classroom if you if you needed to? Um, so pretty much the same um, mixed ability children um, like we were saying I probably put children that are quite happy to talk to each other together or maybe some of the children that are a little bit more confident with some of my shy children to encourage them yeah we'll have a conversation are they typically in twos or threes or 
Um, usually it is in twos, but sometimes um, I'll do it in their lines. There's about five of them in their lines in the carpet. Perfect. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, and same question to you, Emma. Um, I'm a head teacher, so we have from preschoolers all the way up to year six. Brilliant. And uh, we would use talk for, in a variety of ways in the classroom. So within our PSHE scheme, we might do whole circle times um, and we might do sort of a, a smaller group scenario in groups. Um, and then we might do um, children working in pairs. I think the only difficulty is sometimes with mixed ability is sometimes you get children that are really confident to talk and they can overpower. So I think having that flexibility so that if you have children that are really not confident talking, maybe they work in a two, and then those children that are more confident get that opportunity to turn take in a larger group so that they learn that actually they have to listen to others as well. So I think that flexibility is key. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, and Helen. Hi, yeah, I'm in year three and we do. So I have groups of six on a table. Sometimes we do table work and sometimes we do learning partners. I work in the same school as Emma. So pretty much what she said. <laughs> brilliant thank you okay so again like I say if anything today I just want you to take away some practical resources so we've looked at this idea of the listening ladder um, and another resource from school 21 um, that is shamelessly I've been using um, is this one here so I think the idea behind you know grouping for talk is like you say using your knowledge of the students but also planning for it it's the thing that quite often when you look at any kind of extended piece of talk, people have planned the questions, they've planned what they think the misconceptions might be, and they've planned what the responses might be, but they've not necessarily thought about how some of these might look. So paired work, I think all of us could say that we've done that, and that's obviously quite easy, so that just talking to a partner. Um, one that I tend to use quite a lot is trios. Um, so that it's less adversarial. Now, I, I don't mean adversarial as in argumentative, but obviously when you've got two people, it is that kind of one or the other. Um, the idea with trios is you can have a talk partner while somebody else is listening, and that person then can be asked to summarise or critique, um, and then you would switch roles throughout the, the, the conversation. So someone's talking, someone's actively listening, and someone's actively aiming to summarise, I quite like doing this at secondary and I see no reason why it wouldn't work at primary because quite often I'll make my most chatty person my summariser. So they're not dominating the talk between the two, but they're not going to mind because they're quite confident feeding back to the whole class afterwards what the trio were talking about. So that's that's quite a nice one. Um, circle was mentioned previously. So groups of six or more people can face each other in a circle that more kind of collegiate larger group mentality. Um, helpful if you've got a big question so that you need more people and more variety of opinion. Um, and then nest. Nest is a really interesting one. You do it at secondary and everyone falls apart giggling and I think it would be exactly the same in year three. You stand apart from each other and you whisper your ideas to yourself. So this is that idea of when you want independent thought, um, sometimes you just say to people, think for a minute and then go to your partner, but thinking and articulating a difference. So the idea of nest is that you're not just thinking about what you're gonna say, you're articulating it quietly um, while you whisper. Um, and it quite often creates some giggles, so that's quite, <coughs> quite fun. So you've got some others on there. Just kind of open forum. Is there any on there that we haven't used or we think we might wanna use? What, what's our kind of our thoughts on this resource? helpful okay cool helpful i'll take helpful yeah i think it's helpful for the children because it's really visual yeah and and it can be used to layer obviously you can start with nest and move to pair and trios etc that would be quite an extended um talk lesson but yeah we at our school because we had such a kind of big push on on talk we had some form time work where we were looking at talk so we talk taught them the talk protocols in our school which are basically listen, contribute and be kind. They're kind of our, our rules for talk. And then we teach them these and we teach them the roles that we're going to look at um, in a moment as well. Okay, I would like you, 
please in the chat to just summarize your school in a sentence that's deliberately vague have a go sentence that describes your school Brilliant, just starting to get those three, thank you. Okay, I would like us to try something and we're all gonna need to be unmuted because we can't have a session on talk if no one's talking. In my opinion, this may be foolish, but we'll see how we go. Okay, so third Voice 21 resource, because they all work together quite nicely as a package. So you can have your listening ladder on your board, you've got them in the group that you want them to be, and now there is a situation where you want to have a discussion. So discussion roles, having discussion roles in groups isn't a new idea, but what I particularly like about this resource is the sentence starters underneath, I think, offer real scaffolding. So again, I appreciate some of the language might be a little bit um, maybe higher than reception or year one, although I, I, I constantly underestimate and I have a six year old who comes out with things that, whew, yeah, he has got a good vocabulary. So I'm not going to I'm not going to stereotype. So we're going to have a bit of a discussion about one of you finding out about my school. OK, so we're going to have a discussion about the school I work at that you don't know that much about, other than maybe it's called Shenley Brook End School because you were here right at the beginning. So, um, Alex, I'm going to ask you to be the instigator for this discussion. OK. Um, Emma, I'm going to ask you to be the clarifier. Um, Helen, I'd like you to be the prober. And Marta, I'd like you to be the summariser. Mm -hmm. OK. So I've obviously done this without knowing you guys. So I might have made somebody the instigator without them wanting to be <laughs> that kind of person. And um, so, Alex, if you're going to instigate a conversation with me, um, what are you going to ask me about my, my school? Um, <laughs> that's really difficult to think straight away. Um, I don't know. How big is the school? How many classes does the school hold? Brilliant. That's a really good question. So the school has 1,500 students. Um, we are a secondary, so we have year seven all the way up to sixth form. And we are 10 form entry. So 10 forms of 30 arrive every year. Um, so we get 300 children. Um, is there anything that needs clarifying in that explanation that I've given? No, you've, you've clarified the age and the numbers of children. I suppose the only thing that might need further clarification is how many staff do you have? Brilliant. Great question. Um, my staff body is about 92 teachers um, and about 100 wonderful support staff, um, including teaching assistants, PAs, reaper graphics, just all the people you need to make a school um, actually run um prober is there anything you would like to ask about my school hmm. <laughs> thinking about that for a moment okay. um 
Um, that's a lot of members of staff that you've got in your school. How does that work? How do you support each other and other? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's a good question. We support each other by making sure we um, have good CPD and good professional development. Um, we've got a really lovely head teacher who sets the ethos and I saw someone put in their description of their school about lovely you know people that are privileged to work with so we've definitely got a, a good ethos. Um, before I move on to summariser I'm going to point out that you have all fallen into my trap and thank you you've done exactly what the students do you don't use the sentence starters <laughs> even though they're there to help you okay so in terms of probing, that was really difficult, wasn't it? Like, oh my God, what do I ask? I'll just ask something random. Um, I said about having lots of staff, you could have said, what do you think would be the effect of somebody else being out? Yeah. Why do you think you have lots of staff? And um, can you provide an example of all the different type of stuff? So you're doing this exactly what the kids do. Um, <laughs> And it, it's because it sounds really weird to use somebody else's sentence starters. It, it, this is really unnatural the first time you do discussion roles. Um, I did this with sixth form the first time I did it, probably four or five years ago now. And it, they were like, this is the, I was like, you have to use the sentence starters. They were like, this is the most stilted conversation I've ever done, miss. Like, what are you doing? You've made it worse. You've made it awkward. And I was like, no, no, go with it. Um, and you kind of have to kind of break through a barrier uh, a little bit. Um, so I'm not going to labour this activity too much and don't worry I'm not going to make you talk to me too much at the end of a of a day but summariser maybe using some of the sentence starters um, what would you say that you know we've discussed what our main points were okay so the three main things we talked about were uh, the type of the school you work at the size of it and the people the staff who works there yeah Brilliant, thank you. So hopefully again, you can just see how this would work. And it's just a really practical idea. Uh, we've got this on a lot of the uh, desks in our classrooms um, and it is a whole school tool. I don't know, oh I say primary, you see the children such a lot. I don't think if you didn't use it regularly, it would be very effective. <clears throat> and um, because you would spend each time you used it, if they'd forgotten how to use it, the first 10, 15 minutes talking about the different roles. Um, so I found this is something, the more I use it, um, the better it becomes, because what you don't want is your instigator, your prober, your builder, your summariser, and then going, oh, which one's that? What am I saying? What am I doing? Um, so they need this sheet. They don't just know it off by heart. Um, but I think something that if you can use regularly might be might be quite helpful. Have you used anything similar, anyone that's in here, that are, are roles, but not necessarily these? Because we use roles quite a lot in school. So, you know, in a task, you're the organiser, you're the feedback. But have we used roles in any other ways in the classroom? No, I haven't. Okay, dokie. Again, just, just a, a way of doing it to kind of get everyone on task because again if you have a group of six and you're discussing it's quite easy for somebody to become passive and it's that thing again that if one person's talking what are the other five doing but if they're thinking about the question they're going to ask next I would argue that's quite a quite a high order skill so we've looked at the listening ladder we've looked at the groupings and we've looked at the discussion so do you know your context? Now, I'm not going to ask you to put your chat in the school because I've already asked you to do this, but this is based on some evidence from the EEF and I think it's really important. So most things in school fail on implementation. And what they mean by that is schools try lots and lots of different things. Teachers try lots and lots of different things. And we kind of tend to try them for a bit. Then we get bored and then we move on to the next thing. And that's quite often what leads to not failure in schools, uh, but not moving forward. So I've got a head teacher who's very aware of this. Um, and he said to me when I said I'd, I'd really like to go on a bit of a, you know, a, a focus on talk with the staff. Um, and I really think our students could articulate ourselves better. And we just started some of this work and then obviously lockdown kicked in and we were really glad we started it because lots of schools were reporting that they were having their online lessons and nobody was talking and nobody knew how to talk, um, or they were talking a lot, but it's not about what you wanted them to talk about. So 
this was a way of using this even further. But he said to me, if implementing this at school is going to work, you've got to tie it to the things that you already do in school. So the evidence suggests that if you link whatever you want to try in school to the school's context, it will be more successful than if you just kind of drop it in. So all schools, and I'm sure you could nod your head and smile and recite them, have their things. So um, at our school, we have tensile. So we say that students need to be tensile. So T is teamwork, E is expression, N is numeracy, S is solving problems. And I could go on, but it's like the cheesy acronym that you find on the display boards and your school will have them. So just in the chat, can you put an example of something in your school that is students know is the expectations? It might be the values or the attitudes, but basically, do you have a cheesy uh, thing that you say your students are? And if you do, can you put it in the chat for me? Okay, so whatever it might be, all I would say is if you're going to try and focus on talk and talk with your students to build it into something that you're already doing. So be the best talker you can be. It's obviously linked to a language that they're used to. <clears throat> My son's primary school is Inspire. Um, so Independence, numeracy. I can't remember the others. He, he could tell you. Um, and it's about, link, you know, how can you be inspiring in your talk? Um, T-shirt weather is sustainable blazing since my most long periods of time. Okay, I like that. I like that. Different. Um, so yeah, all I would say is if you're trying to get your class to engage in talk and some of these talk protocols, it might be that some of the language of school 21 doesn't necessarily work for your students. Um, and I'd just recommend trying to build it into things that you you already do. Um, so it, it has relevance to them and then they can kind of see it. So if you have kind of class rules about being kind, OK, how can we be kind in talk um, and just link in through that way? So my next question for you, and I am going to cold call a little bit, sorry. Um, is how do you question a talk? So if somebody talks, usually before it, there's a question. So we've got the listening, we've got the talking and we've got the questioning. So how do you plan for talk at the moment? If you know there's something that you want your students to talk about for 10, 15 minutes, how would you plan for it? Um, Alex, what do you reckon? Um, so usually it kind of uh, depends on the topic that we're doing. Um, so for example, at the minute we're doing the three little pigs. <clears throat> um, so as a year group, we would kind of, we would come up with questions um, for each page and then we would ask the children, and obviously, obviously we would make them different depending on who we're asking. So for our higher ability, we'd push them a little bit more and encourage them to respond in a full sentence. Um, and, and if they don't do that, then obviously we model how you would do that. And then for our lower ability, just kind of beginning to get them to maybe name one thing or answer it in a very simple way. Um, and then you know, trying to extend it a little bit further by asking some of the other children to have an opinion and, and that kind of way. So that's, yeah, that's how it works. Yeah, so right. kind of bouncing it around. It's really lovely to hear that the, the questions can come from the, the class and the students kind of inspire that inquisitiveness, that creativity, rather than, I have planned the questions that we are going to, going to be looking at. So that's really lovely to hear. Um, and Marta, same question to you. How do you plan your questions? Do you plan the questions before the lesson or do you wait to just see what comes up? Yeah. Um, I plan questions before the lessons, but what I've noticed throughout the lesson, the children ask their own questions. <laughs> um, so good questions for discussion will probably be open questions that you don't get the answer, yes or no, but then questions that start with why. Why do you think that? So these questions work quite well with my class, trying to make them like open-ended questions. So you don't get one answer, you can get a lot of different answers, so variety. Perfect, thank you for that, Marta. <laughs> so again, um, I think the most important thing isn't necessarily the resource. I think the most important thing is that you plan the questions. Um, I always remember, um, I was very lucky to have an NQT mentor who was quite renegade and was like, don't write lesson plans, they're a waste of time, et cetera, et cetera. But he was very lucky and I was very lucky because he pedagogically was, was quite brilliant. Um, and he used to say, just plan the questions you want to ask. 
then the activity and the resource will come. Um, and he used to observe me by just writing down all the questions that I asked in a lesson. That's all he'd give me at the end, all the questions that I asked. Um, and I'd compare them to the questions I'd written at the beginning. Um, and then he'd tell me off in his lovely way, because um, I would always ask low level questions. So the kind of knowledge questions, the recall question, and he'd kind of say, where are your, you know, your Bloom's taxonomy, where are your create questions, where are your, your analyze questions? Um, and this is why I quite like these two here. So these are questions that teachers can use or students use, but the idea that someone's the prober and somebody's the clarifier. Um, so, you know, what do you think is meant by, what would happen if, um, what makes you say, they're more creative. I think these types of questions are helpful to plan or have up to remind you to ask because you tend to remember to ask the concept questions. So the questions that are, what is it? How long does it last? You know, what color is it? The kind of the knowledge base things. So the clarifier and cl prober questions, some people like using these in our school instead of all the roles that you saw previously. So obviously prober and clarifier were on there. If you think six roles is too many or too complicated, you could just have a prober and a clarifier and they could ask ask these questions. So as you can see from what we've been going through, we've probably so far looked at a couple of resources that might be helpful. So we've looked at the, the idea of the listening ladder. We've looked at the idea of groupings. We've looked at the idea of discussion roles, knowing your context and questioning for talk. So if the idea is that you're gonna go away from this session and just try something, try a resource, try something new, group them in a way you haven't before, I would think that's a success. I think any CPD where someone goes away and just tries something um, is a success. But then how do you know it's worked? So there's lots of ways of monitoring talk. And I just wanted to share one last tool with you. Um, this is a tool we use quite a lot. We're what you call a magenta school. Um, Mike Hughes wrote a book called The Magenta Principles, which is all about how to have lovely facilitative teaching where the children are exploring and the teachers are questioning. And it's got quite a lot of practical ideas in. And one of the things he talks about is tracking teacher talk and learner talk. So when we observe lessons, we tend to observe, and I know I felt like this um, with my NQTs last year, and I'm sure I will feel like it with my ECTs next year. Um, but often you observe for the standards or you observe for behavior. Um, it's very rare that you observe for talk. So it's a really nice focus to have. And it's a really simple way of doing it. You just have this graph um, and you can see one that's been filled out on the other side of the screen. Um, but if you're going in increments of five minutes, in that five minutes, what percentage of the talk was teach talk? And what percentage of the talk was learner talk? And you can just track it. Now, obviously, ideally, I've picked quite a nice lesson here. Um, if you're having a foci on talk, you would like there to be more learner talk than teacher talk, because then you're facilitating and they're really embedding those skills. It should be that you're kind of setting them on the way and saying something and then they're having extended periods of talk. So the first thing you get people to look at is how much is learner talk and how much is teacher talk. Um, we've all had those lessons where you think I have talked far too much and dictated um, and it's just trying to move away from that a little bit. Not that there is anything wrong with teacher talk. Even I admit, you know, there is no lesson where you could just have student talk uh, and it would be, I would argue, successful to the point of where you wanted to get the progress. But it's just about trying to even the balance a bit. What you can then do as well is look at where the teacher talk falls. So what you find quite often is that the teacher talk is quite high at the start of the lesson. You're going to giving them instructions, setting them on their way. And then it can sometimes dip and come up at the end when you're summarizing. Um, and although that could be helpful, it's quite nice to swap it around. Could you have high student talk nearer the beginning so you get all their ideas first and then narrow it down? And it's just a tool for discussion. So you can either, if you're observing a lesson, use this, or you can give it a student and say, your job this lesson is to track the talk. I want you to tell me who's talking the most at what point. And it just makes a nice lesson reflection afterwards to think about the talk and the flow of the talk in the lesson. Um, so that's just something I wanted to share with you, you momentarily. Because when you get observed, you tend to get talking about questioning, but you don't necessarily always talk about talk and the amount of talk in the lesson, unless it is 
is a particular foci. So I'd like to go all the way back to the beginning. Um, the Education Endowment Fund says that oracy, I use the word talk because I just think the students understand more, but the oracy and talk <clears throat> are really effective ways of moving progress forward. Just like you to put in the chat a sentence of the wish for talk in your classroom. You obviously came to this session and you chose to come to a session on oracy and talk. Um, and I just wondered why is it that you you'd like more people in your classroom to talk? Is it that you want the children to be more confident in their talk? Um, but I will stop talking. And if in the chat you can put a little sentence of what's your wish for talk in your classroom? How would you like it to change or improve if you indeed do? Yeah. Lockdown has been really interesting for talk. Like I say, we'd had a bit of a focus on talk before lockdown and it really helped us through lockdown um, when we were doing online lessons, um, getting the students to a mic and to, to actually talk with us. But I can see how absolutely the lack of the lack of talk maybe during early years and key stage one and training in talk would absolutely have an impact. So None of these resources are perfect. They are merely suggestions. I think, you know, a good CPD session, you walk away with things you can try um, and ideas in your head. But I would hope some of these things would do that. The, um, I'm just flashing through, the roles is a really good one for giving people confidence because it's not my stupid question or it's not me having to ask. It's my role, you know, you're the instigator. It's your job. No one can call you a Kino because you're the one that keeps asking stuff. That's the role I've given you. You are the person that's meant to be doing that. So it kind of gives them something to hide behind sometimes, like the challenger. Um, you know, it's your, I'm just being the challenger. It's not me, it's the role. So hopefully that will give them confidence to maybe ask some things that they wouldn't give them some sentence starters. Um, and that idea of, yeah, really focused talk through that questioning. Sorry, I can't find my questioning on that. Um, by that focus questioning hopefully helpful. Um, I've been kind of going through some ideas with Talk For You and you'll have noticed most of them are from School 21. Um, they were the key school in part of the Education Endowment Fund research, which is why I've kind of linked those things um, together. Um, I'm happy to finish there and just open it up to any questions, suggestions, thoughts on oracy or talk. <laughs>